Thank you very much. I need to make sure I can see my hand here. Because I'm going to be written all... all right, so it's great to be here in Bright Club. It's very important uh, in this day and age of higher education strategic planning and KPIs because uh, for us this counts as, as, as academic outreach. And if I tell a joke and you laugh, that will go down on my CV as a societal impact. <laughs> and if you actually get the joke, that will be knowledge transfer. <laughs> so the whole works here. We're all in this together. It's a win-win situation. So yes, I'm a psychologist. I'm in the School of Psychology, and I do a lot of research on psychological stress. Now, psychology is an interesting discipline. Uh, we uh, study, using empirical scientific methods, uh, people's personalities and their thoughts, feelings and behaviours. People think psychology is a bit of mumbo-jumbo, but actually it's a scientific attempt to study something that is a bit of mumbo-jumbo. <laughs> and we often end up studying things that other people say do not exist. So social constructions, like uh, personality or intelligence or altruism, or uh, maybe in, um, stress. And uh, by using our scientific equipment to go trying to measure things that other people say don't exist, we're a bit like Victorian era psychic mediums uh, in academia. So we're all probing for things in the other world that uh, may or may not even be there. <laughs> so what do we do? We measure psychological stress. We actually bring people into laboratories, expose them to stress, and then see what happens to their bodies. So we measure their blood pressure and cortisol and um, and, and various other what we call parameters. And it is amazing to see the impact of stress in the human body. Now one of my colleagues in the Netherlands measures the amount of water that gathers in the eye during stress. <laughs> so you might call that uh, crying. <laughs> We, we prefer to call it data. <laughs> and it is amazing. We, we would love to do things like tie people to chairs and set off chainsaws and start waving things at them. Uh, the Research Ethics Committee would love for us to not do that. So we end up asking people to do complicated things like count backwards and thirteens from a very large number or to do some public speaking. And it is amazing the impact of public speaking stress on uh, the human body. So you see huge increases in all of those parameters, including tears, um, <laughs> equivalent to things like uh, cycling a bicycle. So you can actually do laboratory studies, compare one condition with the other, and you observe the same increases in blood pressure, for example. Okay, um, what you're basically talking about there is the fight or flight response. Um, the fight or flight response is an evolved pattern of physiological responding that reflects the way the body responds to a threat, a danger. And uh, the reason your heart rate increases is to pump more oxygenated blood to your major muscle system so that you can punch or you can run away. Uh, and the dilemma is that in the modern post-evolutionary significant uh, environment, things like deadlines are a major stressor, our traffic jams are a major stressor, and you can't punch those or easily run away from them, but we still have this stress response. So we're particularly interested in that. If you give me a moment. Okay, so everybody thinks that I know how to cope with stress. Uh, because any psychological researcher looking at stress, people think you know how to cope. But we know really nothing, uh, from our point of view at least, about how to cope with stress. Um, we just know how to put the milk into the tea, we don't know how to get the milk back out of the tea. Um, what, 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 we, um, what we hear often is that you can use sort of strategies for coping with stress. Uh, things like imagining your audience in their underwear. Did you ever hear of that one? So, uh, if you're in a job interview situation, this is one of the folk bits of folklore of stress and coping. Um, I don't believe there's an evidence base for that, and uh, I, I, I can't speak to it myself. I don't think it's, it's working. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of off-putting, really, at a time, but I don't want to uh, point any fingers. Uh, okay. One of the things you can do and reflect on is that when you are um, uh, what, looking at a crowd of people like this, there are a few things that happen. One is that psychologically, when we concentrate on something, we tend to forget our appearance. We don't engage in what we call impression management. So this is why when you concentrate on something, you stick your tongue out, because you're concentrating so hard, you really forget about looking good in front of others. Uh, so when you're concentrating at me, 
Um, I, I can see lots of you looking rather slovenly, and you've let your guards down. <laughs> Tongue is out, and so on. <laughs> the second thing that happens that we know in psychology is that we scan our environments looking for threatening stimuli. Uh, so we have this procedure called the face in the crowd. Uh, we show people a matrix of faces and by using eye tracking apparatus we can see that people's eyes are drawn towards negative emotional faces. So this is a bit like the face in the crowd matrix and any public speaking situation is. So your eyes are not naturally drawn to the people who look most unhappy to be here. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, what happens, it, it, but I know, I know that you're finding this very interesting and enjoyable and you're just letting your guard down and my eyes are drawn to people who aren't representative of the actual emotional <laughs> status of the entire group. Okay, but one of the interesting things about stress is that it is pathologized. We see it as an abnormality in modern culture. And I would argue that all the biological research would suggest that actually no, it's quite a normal thing. But psychology has uh, this obsession, if you like, with abnormality, and there's this huge area of psychology called abnormal psychology. And it's a strange construction of a term, it's, a, it's grammatically strange, it parses weirdly. Um, it's, it's really the psychology of the abnormal. Um, we don't say if you have um, uh, uh, an abnormal growth, that that is the same as a growth of the abnormal. Um, but we do say psychology of the abnormal is called abnormal psychology. Uh, but the problem is that psychologists don't have a working definition of abnormality. So for a hundred years they've been writing textbooks about abnormal psychology, but we don't have a definition of abnormal or normality. And there are various ways of approaching this. And one of the uh, common ways of attempting to uh, refer to or define abnormality is to uh, appeal to clinical expertise. So we ask experts. This is a bit of a cop-out, really, but this is the term that's used. We appeal to clinical expertise, we ask experts what's normal and what's abnormal. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that it's down to opinion. And the very first diagnostic statistic manuals that psychiatrists had to work with 50 years ago all had strange things in them. For example, homosexuality was seen as a diagnosis available to a clinician to give to a patient who was, uh, who was gay. Now, nowadays, we're beyond that. Although it does occur to me that in psychology we still tiptoe around the subject of homosexuality and um, we're supposed to use terms uh, other than uh, homosexual or gay uh, in describing people who are LGBT. So for example, for gay men, uh, in journal articles we're supposed to say men who have sex with men. That's the term, MSN. So you get all of these uh, articles like about men who have sex with men in Norway. <laughs> Norwegian men. <laughs> men who have sex with men with depression. <laughs> uh, because you're not supposed to say depressed gay man. <laughs> um, I saw one uh, report by WHO on AIDS and they had recruited a gay social worker to interview people from the LGBT community. And they described in the method section, a man who has sex with men with social work training. <laughs> Maybe that's political correctness. Political correctness, living with significant mental health challenges. <laughs> that's my most contrived joke of the evening. And most of you didn't get it. <laughs> so, the second way, uh, actually, the, um, uh, if you go back, it's not just homosexuality, also heterosexuality has been pathologized. So, in the 19th century, uh, the American Journal of Obstetrics was obsessed with the fact that women wanted to have sex and they declared this a pathology. And at one point it was estimated that 25% of American women required psychiatric intervention because of this symptom of wanting to have sex. Um, in 1881, a neurologist called George Beard wrote this interesting book called American Nervousness, Its Causes and Consequences. <laughs> and he declared that modernity was going to turn everybody mad. And he identified particular things that would be putting the population's mental health at risk. Things like trains, and <laughs> daily newspapers, and the telegram. Um, and uh, another uh, neurologist called Samuel Cartwright identified a condition called drapetomania, which was uh, manifest only in African people kept as slaves in the United States. The chief symptom of which was a depression at being kept as a slave and <laughs> a recurring 
habit of trying to run away. <laughs> so when you have an appeal to clinical expertise as the basis for identifying what's normal and what's abnormal, you're going to run into difficulties. So one of the other things that people do um, is to try to appeal to statistical frequency or infrequency. So they say, okay, it can't just be an expert. Well, let's, let's quantify it empirically using statistics and we identify what is statistically infrequent. But that also leads to difficulties because lots of things are infrequent. I mean, how many people here have flown a kite? <laughs> oh, okay, actually, <laughs> slow to admit it, but it's okay. <laughs> Although, there's only three of you, so that means you're abnormal. <laughs> How many people here have read a novel by Salinger other than Catcher in the Rye? <laughs> One. Two. <laughs> abnormal. Um, uh, how many people here are the type of person who, uh, when something goes out of date in the middle of the fridge, you take it out and throw it away? But if something goes out of date and it's in the door of your fridge, you're liable to leave it there for months, <laughs> maybe even years. <laughs> yep. Uh, actually, that one appears to be normal. Perfectly okay. Okay, how many people have been to Iceland? Okay, we're, we're also at normal. All right, so statistical frequency doesn't work that smoothly, although we, there's still some hope. And one of the reasons it doesn't work that smoothly is because um, of uh, the fact that human beings are comprised of many different traits. Um, and you can statistically quantify what is normal and abnormal using uh, normal distribution uh, theory, because statisticians will say that all traits vary on a continuum from low to high, and the middle 95% is statistically within the normal range. So the top 2.5% and the bottom 2.5% are outside the normal range. Okay, you get that? So let's just say we're talking about friendliness. Um, let's just imagine you have the top 2.5% most friendly people in the world. They're abnormally friendly. Um, the bottom 2.5% people, this isn't a show of hands, you're okay. The bottom 2.5% people, they're abnormally unfriendly. And the middle 95% are the, the normal range. So the probability of being normal is 0 0.95, 95%. Let's take a second trait, like height. So the tallest people in the world are abnormally tall, the shortest people in the world are abnormally short, and the probability of being in the normal range is 0 0.95. But the probability of being within the normal range for both those traits is 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95, which is slightly less than 0 0.95. Okay, let's take a third trait, like um, how much you like milk. So the people who like milk most in the world are in the abnormal range, and the people who like it least are in the abnormally low range, and then the mid-range, the 95%, are the normal range. And the probability of being in the normal range for all three of those traits is 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95, which is even lower again. You thought I would work this out, <laughs> but it's actually lower again. You get the picture. And all it takes is for 59 traits. If you can think of 59 things you can say about a person, the probability of being within the normal range of all 59 of them is 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95. You can see where this is going. You keep going 59 times, and the answer is 0 0.048. It's itself outside the normal range. <laughs> so the probability of being that normal is outside the normal range. It's abnormal. <laughs> that normal. <laughs> so where does that leave us? What have we learned? Well, it's particularly, it's fairly normal at least to be depressed, to get anxious, to uh, suffer symptoms of an emotional nature, to want to flee from slavery, and all of that. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's normal to be so-called abnormal. Um, on the other hand, for statistical reasons, it's abnormal to be extremely normal. So uh, with that, can I thank you for, generally speaking, I hope I haven't uh, disappointed you, uh, thank you for keeping your uh, tongues essentially in your mouth, most of you, during the set, and uh, good night. Woo!